My name's uh, Doug Copeland, and I am artist in residence at the Google Cultural Institute in Paris. And it's a great gig, let me tell you. I, I'm loving it. Um, what I'd like to do right now is let's go back in time to the year 1995. And woo, I come back in a time travel machine from now, and I say, you know what? In 20 years from now, you're going to be able to ask any question you want anywhere on Earth. And in one-tenth of a second, you're going to get the answer. And you go like, wow, no, that's not possible. Surely not. And yet, here we are uh, 20 years later, and we all live with this every day of our life. And it's kind of weird how blasé we are about search and how it's just become another part of our life. Um, one of the weird textures of living in 2015 is that we've actually never been smarter but we've never felt stupider. And that's why I invented the word smoopid. And I actually think the collective human IQ has been rising generally over the last 20 years, so that by 1995 standards, the current average IQ is about 103. But of course, we all feel like it's 97. And there's this other corollary word with smoopid. It's called Stuart. And Stuart means I'm really, really smart. I just don't have Wi-Fi access at the moment. Um, I remember life before Google. Uh, I remember always being driving in a car, driving to the library, going to the reference section, trying to find something really minor, like a, a phone number in another uh, time zone or area code. Um, and I remember being at dinner parties, and there's always some blowhard propagating an urban legend at the table, and you're like, dang, that is so not true, but you have no way to prove it. And I think if nothing else, Google has killed the urban legend. I go to Google about 20 times a day. I think most of us do. It's just part of our life now, like brushing our teeth, combing our hair. Um, you know, I've gone on Street View. I've looked at my house from outer space. I've stalked a few people I used to know years ago. Uh, before I go to a dinner party, I always Google everyone that's going to be there. That used to feel kind of stocky, and now it's just what you do. And people actually kind of get a bit annoyed if you didn't Google them beforehand. Uh, why am I here this morning? Well, it's this. We're, we're going to ask, what is the most important question of our time? And I know the answer, and the answer is this. <laughs> just, just, just kidding. The question is, what are we actually searching for? Um, we're here to talk about this book. It's called Search. It weighs a lot. Everyone, you should all have a copy. If you came to Zeitgeist using carry-on luggage only, I apologize. <laughs> um, the book is one of the few projects we're doing at the Cultural Institute. Um, the book came about because most people really are curious about what are people searching for? What are they looking for? Um, we are hunter-gatherers looking for uh, answers to questions as part of our DNA. So what I suggested was, OK, within the constructs of your data system, uh, what can we do to allow us to look for search patterns? And I came up with the idea of choosing 1,000 words and uh, offering them to the search people. And then they would come back with well, the answer is to what people have been searching for, uh, but uh, before they came to me, they had to go through safe search, then staff had to go through them to remove anything that your uh, child might find weird. And uh, we did the search. It was the month of February this year, globally, uh, God knows how many billions of searches, all English language. And well, we've got searched the book, and to my mind, it is the closest you can come to being on the internet while actually reading what is technically a book. Also, one factor, no search is included that wasn't repeated at least 50 times on a single day. And uh, this is just an in-house rule. It, it uh, makes for better data. 
anyhow, the results were ranked from the top to the bottom, top to one to hundred. And before I show you a few things, this is Marshall McLuhan. He's a media guru. I wrote a, a biography of him a few years back. And he had this theory that to survive in the maelstrom, he called it, he was very prescient. He saw the internet 50 years before it happened. Uh, the way that you stay sane, the way you stay cogent is to look for patterns. Uh, you may not find them, but the act of searching for patterns is what's going to keep you sane. I think have a quick drink. I have this weird thing. I enjoy talking in public, but my mouth goes dry. And I don't know what that's about. And the only other time I get it is when I'm going through customs at an airport. <laughs> so maybe it feels like I'm trying to be fraudulent in some way. So let's have a look at a few things that I have learned from searching and search. Where would the internet be without celebrities? Of course, there's God knows how much stuff out there. One of the words I chose was wife, very fundamental word. And so we put that in the search, and what came back? So I think basically as human beings, we're always looking at celebrities and wondering, did they marry out of their league? And then so you put in the word husband, and of course you get the other way around. Now, the internet, doctor internet. The internet is the doctor for billions of people. And you take a word like symptom, you put it in, and you can see pretty much what's going on in all the bodies on planet Earth. Um, a lot of women's health, that's a very large category uh, online. And it's almost you can look at the, uh, the questions from 1 to 100, and you can see the things that people get the most. I think canker sores, weirdly, is the one thing people get most. Cul-de-sacs. A cul-de-sac is a dead-end road. Take a word like this one, tasteless. What might come in if you put the word tasteless into the search engine? And what you get is this. I think it's like 12 answers. And then you get nothing. And I think the reason that is is because people just don't use the word tasteless to search very much, and it's that simple. Um, and also, probably the results that came in uh, were under 49 single entries uh, per word. Rural words. Uh, my dad has a farm in Canada, so I put in what I thought was a very, very rural word. And even though this was done in English language, I saw, somehow entered the Korean time-space continuum here. <laughs> now, another word. I call them IKEA words. Usually they're indefinite pronouns, uh, like die, which is also D in German, die Zeit. Uh, uh, fad, OK, you put in the word fad. You know, what, what's the latest fad the kids are up to? And you immediately find out that fad is actually a word in Norwegian or, or Swedish or something. You take another word, hint. I don't know, people are maybe looking for hints and they're playing a video game, which is a huge category. Instead, I think this is Turkish. I think it's like dance music in Turkish. Is what, it, what is it? Thank you, you've solved the mystery. It's the power of crowdsourcing in action. OK. Uh, OK, here, what do the following searches have in common? Can you read that OK? OK, what they have in common is that uh, people around the world use the internet to do their homework. And quite often, you look through a category, and then you'll get, like, you know, uh, a squared plus B squared is or is not equal to whatever, whatever. And like, that's a really weird question. And then sometimes, depending on how popular the textbook is or how people just put in the whole thing verbatim. So it really skews. Um, 
okay, this is one thing. Sometimes it can really, really surprise you. Um, so we put this in, and the answer to this is man boobs. The internet has this seemingly unslakeable thirst for information on what man boobs are, how to get rid of them, why do we have them. We're learning about ourselves online here. Recency, this is a category that's very important to search. The month of February, the biggest words that month were Fifty Shades of Grey, Valentine's Day, and the Super Bowl. And uh, when going through the results, we had to actually, room Fifty Shades of Grey, we would pull it all out and leave the top reference just to show that it was top dog that, that month or what have you. But then you get things like, okay, a word like rigged. I was very curious to see how people think what might be rigged in the world, and this is what came up. And it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, this is the power of recency. This is just the power of how the news can just completely obliterate a category overnight. Random. There is some really random stuff out there, and here's the word school, and you plug that in, and you get this. And how the hell did that happen? And what it is, sometimes things like this just slip through the gate. It's got the bots or crawlers that go through the system. And you just spew these things out. And sometimes they're so interesting, you just keep them. Because they tell us something weird about ourselves. Not quite sure what. OK. So sometimes you have words that are slightly problematic. Hang on. I thought that would get more of a laugh. <laughs> you take a word that's possibly offensive on its own, and you plug it in, ends it up, ends up being really funny shit, as you can see up here. It's weird doing something like this because you kind of mentally guesstimate like how fast the audience is reading, <laughs> and if you go too quickly, it means you're like disrespecting their intelligence. Or you're, anyhow, <laughs> let's go to the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> this is called a branding warp. This is another pattern I noticed: is that if you take a word, in this case, it's the word theft, and you plug it into the system, what are you going to find? And what you find is that. Grand Theft Auto completely ate up the entire theft category. Sometimes with secret, Victoria's Secret products ate up the word secret. It just kind of happens sometimes. Now let's go. This is interesting. Sometimes one event, a word, can just eat up a category in a very unusual way. Now I'm going to show you this. This is the word air. And I'll let you read these here. And what this is, is the brother of Paris Hilton was on a flight from A to B to C or what have you, got very, very drunk, and then walked through the plane calling everyone peasants <laughs> and said, my dad's really rich and he's going to buy my way out of this. And so what happens is people like send this story like crazy to all their friends, and, and this ends up in the search category. And it's sort of karmic payback for the young Hilton there, I think. Now, another surprise with people, we go from air to hair. And what could be more fundamental? And so you put in the word. And what comes out is uh, hair extension style, blah, 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 blah. And you think, oh, well, we are, we are a vain species, aren't we? And then suddenly, oh. And this is actually a very, very common question that appears over and over. And I was kind of like almost like moved by this when I saw it. Is Google an oracle? Some people treat it that way. Uh, some people actually look at Google as sort of an omniscient em entity, and they ask it questions um, in the form of a question. Here, for example, you can see these. This is my favorite one of all, is how long is a 5K? <laughs> <laughs> Subtle. <laughs> um, but. Uh, we're all people, and we all know what it's like to be at your laptop or computer going through this kind of mood we're seeing right here. 
And what happens is people put in this kind of question. And they don't just put them in a few times. These questions, there's like hundreds of thousands of times these questions come through. And you realize that there's like someone is at a keyboard somewhere actually typing this in, and they had to be going through this to make them ask this question. I think that's sort of a wonderful, uh, inspiring thing. Uh, what do we learn from all this? Well, people are way smarter than you think. And I think we're entering this era where intelligence is marked uh, not only by the questions you ask, but how you search for those questions. I think if I was in education, uh, a new course instead of social studies might be searching studies. How do you get what you want when you need it? People are really always looking for pizza. There is so much pizza on the internet, you wouldn't believe it. It's just everywhere. How do I get pizza? Where do I find it? Where's the nearest pizza place? Another thing that defines us as humans is that we're always trying to get more sleep. Insomnia is a huge category. Um, uh, snoring, anything to do with like getting even one more minute of sleep is massive. People are also, I think Ahmet touched on that before, they're always looking for meaning. We're always looking for something larger than ourselves. And people are always surprising. And those are the first capital letters you see in the entire presentation. Search is always done in lowercase only. <sighs> Read the book. Give it a look. It's great. As I say, it's like you dive right in, and you come back out. And it feels like you're in a three-hour warp looking for kitten videos or something. It's a very similar psychic dynamic. Um, I would like to thank Google for having me here today and for giving me such a great gig at the Cultural Institute in Paris. And thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you.